our sanctification. <clears throat> what a beautiful and wonderful story in song. <clears throat> I'm reading tonight from the Proverbs, chapter 5. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 5, I believe that it was about eight years ago or nine, I did a series on Wednesday nights preaching on Proverbs where we took what was called words from the wise man, <clears throat> and uh, I had for the first years of my ministry, looked through Proverbs, how do I preach it? And one day the Lord helped me to just see I could take all the times and make these, uh, pull these together. And so, now I'm as much a creature of habit as anyone else. <clears throat> so, you know, you work on something a while, you think you're to the end of it. But this week I was sitting in my office just praying and reading my Bible and I had read where I normally read, made my way over to Proverbs with just kind of tiptoeing through it and picking out this and that. And when I came to chapter 5, I, <clears throat> I just, it began to come. And then I thought, well, this is Valentine's Day week. On uh, Friday was Valentine's Day. And uh, while we don't celebrate it in the way the world does, uh, I thank God for a wonderful wife and uh, uh, someone that loves me. I love her. And uh, in Proverbs chapter 5, the heading of this chapter is warning against unchastity. So the word that is sometimes used to describe purity is chaste. The New Testament uses the word C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste, to indicate pure, clean, and it generally refers to moral cleanness or moral purity. God wants His people to be morally pure. God wants us to have pure actions, pure hearts, and pure minds. We are living in an unchaste, in a polluted, filthy society. I was reading, and I did a little bit, I didn't go into the full, exact depth of it, but 50% of marriages end up in divorce. That's staggering. It is just as high in the church as it is in the world. But let me tell you something else even more staggering. Over 50% of men in the church are involved in pornography, internet pornography, impurity, immorality in some way in their minds. That's a staggering number to me. That's sad. That's tragic. Now, I want to say something before we move on tonight. I, I do want to say something. When I read the study, I am a little bit critical, and here's why. And I'm going to, I'm just going to, we're going to level tonight, okay? We're not going to be inappropriate or improper. This is a sacred desk, and the church is a sacred place. But a little uh, out front honesty is necessary, and that's this. In the, in the study that was done, the statement that was made, over 50% of men have had impure thoughts. I want to stop right there a moment and say, that is not a sin. 50%. Folks, thoughts come to our mind every day. You cannot drive down the road without a thought of impurity coming to your mind. 
I drive to uh, up the interstate, and there are seductively dressed women in bikinis advertising for, uh, for uh, Sturgis Rally, Deadwood. And I want to tell you honestly, when you see that, thoughts come to your mind. But the key is you don't have to dwell on them. You can resist them. You can't walk through Walmart without impure thoughts coming to your mind. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. Whoever came up with this idea of wearing these leotard looking things. That is disgusting. And the only thing worse is the ones that shouldn't be wearing them. It is really bad. I thought, honey, if you think you're sexy, you have got you need to go look in the mirror. That is gross. That makes totally unimpure thoughts come to my mind. I'm like, boy, you need to go bury that. That's terrible. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful here, but I just got to be honest with you. It's awful. In a country that years ago, when you went to a beach, there were people there that a woman had to have what she wore on the beach approved before she could go out in public. You didn't know that. Yes. They used to have, before a lady could go out on the beach, she had to go in and it had to be approved as being modest on the beach in America. So I guess what I'm trying to get to tonight, dear men and ladies, let's not be stupid or foolish to think that when a thought comes to our mind, we have committed a sin. You have to make a choice. I refuse to dwell on that. Okay? We're red-blooded men. We have natural desires. And just one step further with carefulness. Love is one of the most beautiful things in all of creation. It is divinely created by God. There is nothing dirty about love. And we the church need to make that known. It is beautiful. The world is the one that has made it dirty. But it is beautiful. When a lady and a man come together in marriage, it is a miracle of God. And it is beautiful. And we ought to celebrate it and thank God for it. Okay? It's a wonderful thing. And I want to tell you, it's a wonderful thing. I can truly say that when my wife and I got married, we had not known anyone else before. That ought to be celebrated. Amen. By the way, People who mess around before marriage have a higher percentage of divorce than those who didn't. So this stupidity, I know a young lady that was having trouble. She and her husband were having trouble in the holiness church. So they decided to go see a counselor. Went to the counselor... And the counselor counseled for a little time, and then finally the counselor said to her, have you, uh, have you ever tried seeing other men? No. Well, that's probably your problem. You need to go out and try the field. There may be others. You, you might just not be compatible. And she was stunned. And she ought to have been. That is wrong. Yes, sir. Let me just say something to you tonight. If you're satisfied with Jesus, you're satisfied with your companion. Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. Purity. Moral purity. Chastity. 
In Proverbs chapter 5, we're going to read some scripture and then we're going to begin to pull some thoughts out of it. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, come not nigh the door of her house, Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say, How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. Drink waters of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them be thine only. Excuse me, be only thine and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. The book of Proverbs deals a lot with marriage and with the relationship between a husband and wife. This passage tonight and into chapter 6, beginning at 6 and verse 20, also deals with the dangers of unchastity. It has several moving parts in it tonight. First of all, as we look at this tonight, let's look for a little bit at the proverb writer's challenge to discretion. To be discreet in verse 2, that thou mayest regard discretion. The first step toward immorality in any way is to disregard discretion. The word discreet speaks of carefulness. It means to walk carefully as if to tiptoe in a dangerous place. And so the writer is saying, if you're going to remain pure in heart, in mind, in action, in your marriage or outside of marriage, the number one thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be mindful to be discreet. That means being careful. That means there are some places you cannot go, some things you cannot do, some things you should not think about, some things you should not engage in. You cannot be too discreet. Now, today they call the holiness people Puritans. They call us narrow-minded and Dirty old men because we want wives and, and ladies to dress modesty, modestly. Actually, they're wrong. We believe in discretion. We believe in being careful. We believe the body is reserved for the companion, not for the world. And friends, the absolute looseness and lewdness, I want you to listen to me. In the 1950s when the battle came over television, the people that took a stand against it were right. I was just reading the other day. What was the name? There was a, I remember it as a boy. Some woman that would do her head like this and she was some kind of a, a witch, I don't know, witch or something. Was it witched? Yeah. 
Bewitched. You, do you remember some, huh? You remember that? Yeah, yeah. And some woman that dressed up. And her attire was condemned back in that day by the movie industry. They had to lift the standards. But by today's standards, she's well dressed. I remember as a boy growing up in, in around my father, uh, watching shows on television. I remember the Dukes of Hazard and that scantily clad wicked girl that was Daisy, what her name I think it was. I'm going to tell you tonight, folks, the absolute immodesty of our world today ought to be shocking, and I want our children to be shocked by it. I do. God has set bounds. And the scripture says that the ladies are to be modest. Now, you're, you're already saying, you know when they say, well, you're dirty old men because all you do is preach to the women. I would like to point something out to you. The scripture speaks mostly about dress to the women. And I want to tell you why. Do you know why pornography is geared toward men? Men are attracted by what they see. Women, I'm not going to say they aren't, but that isn't the first thing. They are attracted by affection, by love. I've seen the ugliest old goat walk around with a beautiful woman, and I've thought, man, is something wrong with her eyes? And if you don't believe me, look at this beautiful lady and me. I told her the other day, I said, I am so glad we fell in love before you got glasses. Because it would have been over with had it been. But you know what? It is natural. God created it that way. And the statement, if you've got it, flaunt it, is not a scriptural principle. The word modesty means to be covered. It means to not show. The whole concept of it is to be careful. And I'm telling you tonight, discretion is the right way to live. Now, this needs to be an action that's taken place on the part of the lady. But it also needs to be on the part of the men. Men need to be discreet. For a man to be discreet, a man needs to be careful where he goes, what he looks at, and what he says. Discretion. And if you're going to keep a pure heart, you're going to have to be discreet in your own actions. Now, in chapter 5, Verse 2, that thou mayest regard discretion, that thy lips may keep knowledge. The first rule of discretion is to be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. That's the reason why tonight I don't go around and I'm not trying to broad brush. But that's the reason tonight that I don't go around calling your wives honey. And saying to your wives, wow, that's a beautiful outfit you're wearing. That would be totally inappropriate. Yes, Sister Stacy isn't married, and I wouldn't talk like that to her. That's inappropriate. This lady has a husband, and I have her as my wife. It's my job. To compliment her. And it's inappropriate. It's not discreet. For me to go around with my lips. Using them to build up other people. And somebody says. Well I don't see anything wrong with that. Well I'm sorry. You need to think this through. In carefulness with the scriptures. I believe that it is completely. Uh, within the bounds of what God wants. Is that we be careful with our words. 
and that we be careful with our eyes. We, uh, I knew a, a pastor, a preacher, and his wife that they had had a big problem within their church. And uh, finally, a, a man left. And uh, she, uh, the, the lady later said, numbers of the women said, it felt like when he looked at us, and they didn't talk about this beforehand. Later on, this came out. He looked like he was undressing us. Now, that may be to the extreme, but I'm telling you that's inappropriate. We need to be discreet with our lips. Go down to verse 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable. We need to be discreet in our thinking. Now it's quite interesting here what he's saying in chapter 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. This is the adulterous woman. And lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Another way, in other words, she doesn't want you to think clearly and so she's constantly on the move to keep you from being able to focus. You better focus and fix your mind and be careful with your thinking and ponder that which is right. Not allow your mind to wander. You ever heard that saying? My mind is wandering. If anybody finds it, bring it back to me. I need it. <laughs> you know, that's where a lot of people get in trouble. Sit and wander. They begin to think. And there's nothing wrong with thinking. I wish more people did it. But be careful what you think. Yes, sir. And then, uh, verse 8. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. We need to be discreet in our associations. Where we go, what we involve ourselves in, the situations we get caught in. I struggle today. I, I, uh, I was raised by a generation that if uh, you were in a building and a woman came into that building, you left. If you were in a vehicle, you never got in a vehicle with another woman that was not your wife. That was not discreet. That was not safe. That was not good. And uh, I'll never forget when I was in Bible school. So this is 27, 28 years ago. Some man wrote an article, brother, get out and stand in the rain. What if you go to church? There's a lady on the porch and it's raining and you have a car. What do you do? And you don't have enough, brother, let her have the car and get out and stand in the rain. It's better to be careful than it is to get yourself in a dangerous situation. You might say, Brother Woodard, that is really to the extreme. But I just want to say tonight, we have to be careful and be discreet. And I will say this, I, I have been thrown into situations. You know, uh, I would have, early on, I would have never thought about female funeral directors but do you know I'm often thrown into a situation I don't like it but going to the cemetery there's a female funeral director I'm not alone because generally there's a body in the back but anyway <laughs> what's the defense of chastity well the number one defense is to love your companion. That's the number one defense. Love your companion. Can I get an amen? amen. I need a good amen there. <laughs> amen. I didn't say like them. I didn't say tolerate them and put up with them. Love your companion. That's active. That's purposeful. You say, well, I don't know where you're getting that. Well, I'm getting it out of the Bible. Verse 19 says, be thou ravished always with her love. And I just want to say tonight, <clears throat> it's hard to get a man into adultery when his wife loves him. 
Amen? You know, I've had situations, I've had to counsel, I've had to talk to people. My husband cheated on me and it was terrible, it was awful, it was, it was sad. But I'm too stupid to not ask the next question. I've said, do you bear any responsibility? Why would you ask that? Do you love your husband? Well, well, it's amazing how quick the tears dry up. Well, he, I don't owe him anything. 1 Corinthians 7 says, Let every man have his own wife. And it further says, Defraud ye not one another. Do you know you are stealing from your companion if you do not love them? Amen. That is script, folks. I know we don't preach like this anymore, but it needs to be preached sometimes. It is a sin against your marriage and against God. God said... Paul said, don't even use religious things without the consent of your companion. If you're going to fast, you go get your husband or your wife's permission. God will never tell you to violate the Word of God. And if the Bible says love your companion and you're not doing it, you are sinning against God and against your companion. God will never tell you to do that. Amen. And um, men have problems with selfishness, but so do ladies. Amen. And you'll destroy your marriage if you're not living. You read 1 Corinthians 7, Paul said, you don't own your body, your companion does. <gasps> really? You don't really mean that. I do mean it. People go around saying, well, look at all the kids they have. Well, what's your problem? Amen? And I'm just talking about love. I'm not saying you have to have a whole bunch of kids, but I am saying you better love one another. And uh, you go home and look up the word be ravished, but I'm telling you, God expects you to love one another. Now, there's a second defense. Aren't you glad I'm moving on? I am, because that's uncomfortable. But number two, do not share your love life with anyone else. Verse 17, let them be thine own and not thy strangers with thee. You know what's disgusting is some man that has to talk about his love life. The last thing anybody ought to want to hear is some big old brute's exploits. And you know what? It's disgusting. And somebody... And I've even been around church people who thought they had to make hints and drop little subtle ideas. That is gross and disgusting and should never be talked about outside of your marriage. That belongs to you and your companion only. And you want to talk about destructive to the marriage is when one or the other has to kind of, you know, brag and talk... The Bible says you don't do that. If you want to defend the sacredness of your marriage, you keep that to yourself and to your companion. Amen. Right. Defending chastity. Do not wander. Number three, do not wander or trifle. Let's go over to chapter 7. <clears throat> Chapter 7, verse 5, that they may keep thee from the strange woman. Now, in the Proverbs, when you read that strange woman, it also means adulterous woman, which flattereth with her words. And then let's go to verse 6. 
For at the window of my house I looked through my casement, beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. You know what that young man was doing? He was hanging around places he should not have been. He was simple, which means he was dumb. If you hang around the magazine racks, you aren't very smart. In fact, can I go a little further? If you hang around on the internet at night, surfing, you just pretty well might surf into an area you should never be. The internet has brought pornography. Did you know that pornography is a $12 billion industry? It's unthinkable. I listened to a preacher tell half the men in his church admitted to being involved in pornography online. Don't go put it in a back room. Put it in the living room where your wife can see what's going on. Don't hide. I don't under... Brother Wheeler, I don't understand this concept that is developed in the holiness movement that wants to hide it somewhere and put some fellow out in a shed. That's dumb. Don't do that. Don't go in the dark of the night. Don't go out into the street trifling around... Friend, if you have a weakness, tell your companion about it. And that companion needs to be forgiving and helpful and realize this is something I can help my loved one through. But don't wander around in dangerous areas. Let's go over to the book of Genesis. I want to point something out to you. You may not agree with it, but you don't have to for it to be right. Genesis, I believe it's 34. Genesis 34. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 34. This is dealing with Dinah, <clears throat> the daughter of Leah. Genesis 34 and verse 1. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now generally when I read this story and I think about what happened, I'm incensed. It was wrong. Verse 2, And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, Prince of the country saw her. He took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel, spake kindly. And he said, give me, in verse 4, give me this damsel to wife. Verse 5, when Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, now his sons were with the cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace till they were come. Now you study the story. <clears throat> uh, it was wrong. Okay, it was wrong. But I just want to point something out to you. Dinah had no business. That phrase, she went out to see the daughters of the land. She shouldn't have been out wandering around in places she shouldn't be either. Call me an old prude if you want to, but I remember when I used to tell my grandma, can I go to the mall and hang out? Do you need to buy something? No. What are you going to hang out there for? And then I discovered why people like to go there and hang out. They go there to mess around. I'm not saying it's wrong to go to the mall. It's not wrong to whatever. But I guess what I'm saying is there are some areas our young people don't need to be hanging around. And whatever those areas are, you know, I don't know where they all are, but you know where they are. And generally it's where the big crowd is. 
And it's where the loose crowd, where they're talking and spitting their chaw tobacco and being all big and tough and wearing their high top tennis shoes and looking all tough and big and dudes. And generally that's where they get in trouble. And so you know what discretion is? I'm not going to hang around. And married couples, if you want to protect your marriage, be careful where you go and the places you get yourself. If you want to defend your marriage, be ever so discreet about where you go and what you get involved with. Nothing more beautiful than fellowship. I, uh, I love it that our families fellowship, but you know, I will tell you, there can be a danger in getting too familiar. I've seen couples that couldn't be apart. And then down the road, that marriage was defiled by immorality. Nothing wrong with fellowship, friendship. We want our, but be very careful. And don't allow the devil to develop and bud a relationship that could lead the wrong way down the road. Ever so careful. I want us to look at verse 6, and I'm winding down now. You'll be happy to know. In chapter 6, the proverb writer is saying, he continues here in verse 24, to keep thee from the evil woman. How does the adulterous woman behave? Now, I want to say something. This is the adulterous man too. Look at her flattery. The flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Verse 5 of chapter 7, From the stranger which flattereth with her words. Over and over, the writer of Proverbs brings out her flattery. That constant, you're what I've always been looking for. Oh, your wife must, you're so, she's so lucky to have you. You, oh, every time I see you walking in the door, I just, oh, you know what I'm saying? Follow me? You better watch that person. That's danger signal right there, the flattering one. I don't trust a flatterer anyway. Somebody comes up to me and says, you're the greatest preacher I've ever heard. And I turn it off. Yeah, they must have been fell asleep or something. Flattery. But that's not all. Verse 25, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. <laughs> in the proverb writer, isn't he specific? Isn't it interesting how much attention is given in the makeup world today to the eyes? I'm so happy to see you. How am I doing? Am I doing it good? And you know what I can't get? I can't get these women who put these big old eyelashes on. I saw one the other day. Great big old eyelashes. I thought, man, she going to a clown show. Then she fell into a bucket of latex paint and had it all over her face. <laughs> Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Let me tell you something tonight. Good, holy ladies don't need a bunch of latex paint on their face to be beautiful. They don't. There's a natural beauty in a godly person that shines out. But beauty that is put on, that's faked, it... it, it and by the way, can I tell you something? All the models out there, did you know that most of them are photoshopped? Airbrushed. What you see on that magazine in the line at Walmart ain't the real thing. I listened a while back to a model talking and she made the statement. She was given some kind of a talk about modeling and she got up and she said, I know what y'all are thinking. You're looking at me thinking, look at that body. Look at how great I look. And you're probably thinking I'm the most confident, confident person in all the world. But she says, I cry myself to sleep. I feel so insecure. I hate my life. 
I'm being exploited every day. Do you know that's happening? Look at what's been going on in Hollywood with this Harvey Weinstein garbage that's been going on. Look, what that man did was wrong. But I want to tell you something else. A lot of these women coming out, they were willing to sell themselves for a movie role. And when you hear about the casting couch, it was an evil, vile place where young girls were defiled. And I'm telling you tonight, folks, if all you see is the surface, you're missing what real beauty is. And it's amazing when a person begins to wander away from God, you know what they start doing? They start looking for ways to make themselves beautiful. I, you know, Brother Albert Dodd used to preach. He used to say, if I was in Hollywood and I was looking for a young movie star, I'd go to our holiness Bible colleges and get a beautiful young lady from there. Now, he would have probably beat them up if they came to the school. But I'm telling you tonight, if you want to see real beauty, look at someone who's found Christ and who's loving the Lord with all their heart. Friends, real beauty shines out. It doesn't have to be added on. That's the truth. That's good preaching. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. <clears throat> In verse 26, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. But here's the disaster tonight of immorality. I'm going to close with this tonight. Oh, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I got to touch one more thing. In chapter 7, it continues there. Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Not only is beauty something that's often painted on, but the attire. There is attire of a harlot. Did you know that in Scripture... The painted face is identified with harlotry. It is in Scripture. And uh, the attire of the harlot, someone who wears clothes that's revealing of their body, that is the attire of a harlot. God wants us to be modest, clean, holy people. Let me finish with uh, the destruction, the disaster of adultery. Why do people do it? A lot of people do it. A lot of people do it because they think they can get by with it. But verse 21 of chapter 5 says, The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Amen. God knows. If you're doing it in your mind, God knows. And you need to ask God to forgive you and ask you to live a clean, pure life. Amen. That's good truth. Not only that, some people do it because they think it's fulfilling. But it's not. It's not. And they do it because they think or they don't realize the consequences. But in chapter 5 and verse 23, he shall die without instruction and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Ladies and gentlemen, it is hard for a person who involves themselves in immorality to come back. It is so destructive. They put the temporary above the permanent. The pleasure of a moment over the pleasure of a lifetime with their spouse. That is so tragic. But I want to tell you tonight, you cannot avoid the consequences. For in chapter 6 and verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whoever toucheth her shall not be... You cannot play with fire without getting burned. Right. It's going to happen. The disaster. First of all, the person who does this is going to be despised for what they do. 
In chapter 6 and verse 30, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But do you know why they despise a person involved in immorality? Because it is so self-centered. If a thief's hungry and goes and steals for that, people can understand that. But the most selfish choice a person can make is to gratify their physical desire by immorality. It is so despised. And God says the person that does it, they'll not be beyond being despised. Let me go further. It is destructive in verse 32 of chapter 6. Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. I'm intrigued by something in the scriptures. The scriptures says that every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But the sin of fornication is against his own. You know why? It corrodes your own body and spirit and mind. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. It has a spiritual impact. I knew a man that was involved in immorality. He could never lift his head again. Even though he tried, that was his, he broke a barrier in his life. He broke over in that area and he could never ever seem to climb back out of it. I'm not saying that it's not forgivable, but I'm telling you tonight, it is so destructive. In chapter 6 and verse 33, A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. He will forever live under the dishonor of what he's done. And finally, it is just flat damaging. Immorality is so damaging. Dear people, God help us to be chaste. God help us to be pure. Keep our marriages pure. Wives, love your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Husbands, you need to learn to compliment your wife. Thank her for what she does. She needs to hear you tell her that she's beautiful. She won't be attracted by other voices. I talked to a man... His marriage had fallen apart. He saw my wife and I's relationship. He looked at me one day and he said, You know, Brent, I realize I did it all wrong. His wife ran off with a worker at their place. The marriage ended. Today she's not married. He's not married. But he said, I never one time told her, Honey, you look so nice. I never one time told her she was beautiful. Folks, by most human estimation, she was a beautiful lady, but he never told. And guess what? When a man came along and told her that, she was susceptible. And ladies, if all you do is nag and criticize your husband, don't be surprised if he's in the arms of another woman. J.B. Chapman said, Wives, if you don't love your husbands, some other woman will. And I'm telling you tonight, God wants us to have happy homes. Folks, there's nothing more blessed than a marriage, a beautiful union between a man and a wife. But you're going to have to determine... I'm going to keep the fire of love alive. I'm going to guard myself and I'm not going to let anything slip in and destroy that love between us. Aren't you glad I'm going to India? I'll be gone for two whole weeks. Dear Jesus, now Lord, I feel as light as a feather. I've preached a hard sermon, but Lord, I felt like this is what you told me to do tonight. I pray, Lord, that this thought and these truths will grip our minds and get a hold of us. Maybe tonight, Lord, some couples need to go home and sit down and
talk to one another. But I pray, Lord, that you would bless our homes. Make this church, Lord, a great example of happy homes and marriages. Now guide us and be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and you're dismissed.